You'll find love when you look into his eyes. You'll find love when he puts his arms around you. You'll find love in his nail-scarred hands and feet. Love died for you. And we'll preach this gospel until the whole world knows Jesus. Regardless of what you face today, there is nothing impossible with Jesus Christ. Hey everyone, welcome to today's show. I'm so incredibly excited to be here right now, to be here with you. I want to encourage you that Jesus is here with us. And where Jesus is, all things are possible. Today is one of the great honors of, of my life. I'm here with, with Pastor Bill Johnson. You know, I, I was going through a very difficult time, Pastor Bill, about a year and a half ago. And um, I was sharing with you earlier that, that a friend of mine, Joy Dawson, sent me a mm -hmm. CD or DVD. Mm -hmm. And you taught on honor and just reinforced the fact that God is good. Yeah. And preaching the gospel consistently and praying for the sick, it's so easy to focus on what God's not doing. But I want to thank you. I believe that God has stirred you and anointed you to release to our generation that God is good. Yes. And to focus on what God is doing. And so just on behalf of our family, uh, I'm so honored to be with you. It's really a, a privilege for me to be here. Your teachings have Thanks. changed my life. You know, I grew up around crusades. And I thank God for them. My life's yep. been forever changed. But after listening to you, I wanted to become a crusade. I, <laughs> I wanted to, to take that everywhere. So thank That's you so awesome. much just yeah. for your life, for, yeah. for your integrity. <clears throat> We're actually up here in Reading right now, which is a wonderful privilege. And just your heart, your humility, the way you live your life is a great, great example. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're thank you for Thanks. being here. Thanks. It's a treat, treat to be with you. Yeah. Uh, I want to get right into it because <clears throat> I don't know anyone... Uh, with a stronger word of wisdom teaching gift uh, than, than Pastor Bill. I've, I've heard you refer often to your childhood, growing up, your father's heart uh, for worship, mm -hmm. his heart, what that did to, to your soul, the, just the fingerprint that left. I grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. was saved as a 12-year-old boy. But it wasn't until I heard the gospel preached that Jesus became really real to me. And same with my wife. You know, she grew up around church, but Jesus didn't become very real to her until she was about 20. When did Jesus become real to you, and how did that happen? Hmm. Uh, phases. It, it happened in phases. I was about six, and then I was about 16, and then the overwhelming dramatic transformation happened. I was about 19 to 20. Yeah. Where I... I I, I was more aware than any other time I had said yes. I said I said the absolute yes, the absolute yes, no matter what, this is it. And yeah. uh, and just gave myself to to really follow the Lord no matter what. And all the previous times, I mean, I as a child, I didn't know what it meant, but I did my best, you know. Yeah. But something happened. Um, I had heard the preaching of Mario Murillo, wow. who has since become a dear friend, but it was all or nothing. And, uh, and that message really challenged me to a different level of discipleship than what I had known um, previous. So mm. I, uh, I, said, I said, yes, it took me a while to get there, but when I did, it was absolute. Yeah. It's never been up for reconsideration. Wow. In the life of your father, I, yeah. I hear you refer to him so often that I'm sure that impacted you greatly. Absolutely. I mean, my, you know, I've, I have a wonderful family. I was, I was raised in a great, uh, great home, great mm. environment. Uh, something really specific that really transformed my life was when he began on this journey in worship, realizing that ministry to the Lord was the number one priority. Yes. And that just so impacted everything around us, the church, our family, everything. I, I, remember, I remember the series that he did out of Ezekiel mm -hmm. on ministry in the inner court and the outer court. And I remember just uh, sitting back about six rows back on the aisle you know, I just remember him uh, speaking on that. There was no altar call. There was no response opportunity given. But when he was through, I bowed my head. I said, God, I give you the rest of my life to teach me that. I know I've heard a lifetime word, a lifetime call, that, mm. that we have been summoned to be worshipers. And so I say yes. I say yes to that. And to touch the heart of the Lord first. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah just to minister to him, not, yeah. 
not just, I mean, the corporate gathering's really vital. I, I'm a big fan of the corporate gathering. Sure. But it's got to work outside when you're alone. It's, it's who you are when nobody's watching. Mm. As, a, as a real uh, follower of the Lord and a real worshiper, one who just really loves the presence. And, yes. And uh, so that, that was just a commitment I made at that moment, and it forever changed everything. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was talking to my father in law one time about his life in the healing ministry. He told me a story of how his dad was dying of cancer, mm. and his whole, all of his brothers were in the ministry. It was a great move of the Holy Spirit. Their lives had been transformed at Miss Kuhlman's meetings. And right. Now here's his dad dying. Right. And he's seeing people in the meetings get out of wheelchairs, mm -hmm. great glorious outpourings, and his dad is not getting healed, and his dad ultimately dies. Mm -hmm. And at the funeral, as he was burying his father, he had to leave the next day and go preach for a gentleman named Bill Swatt up in Ohio mm -hmm. and conduct a healing service. And his family was saying, well, you know, how are you gonna go preach a healing service after dad just died? Right. How can you do that? How can you say that God wants to heal you? Did God not want to heal dad? And he said that day was a huge turning point of his life. Yep. He had to make a decision that Jesus heals the sick and I'm not gonna blame him if, for dad's death. That's right. And I, uh, I've heard you mention or refer to a similar experience. Same I know Maria thing. Woodworth Edder lost so, many, so much family due to yeah, sickness. Yeah. Was there a similar turning point or what, how did that experience frame your life as someone who sees incredible miracles today? Yeah, the same, same basic thing happened, you know, just seeing personal loss. But you have to, it, it just comes back to if I fill my heart with what hasn't happened, I will stumble throughout my life. I'll question God's nature, His character, His gospel, the covenant He's made with us. I'll have to ask questions every time I see a sick person. Is it God's will? Is it not God's will? Right. Those are all things that Jesus answered in His lifetime. He healed everyone who came to Him. There were no exceptions. Right. He healed everyone the Father directed to, uh, Him to. Uh, there were no exceptions. And He delivered uh, everyone in, in the same way. So... Um, there's just a decision that I, that I had to make. Am I going to fill my heart with what God's doing? Mm. If I can't discern what he's doing, then I can fill my heart with what he's done. The history of God's testimony, that's his resume. That's the legal precedent that's right. been set that I have a responsibility to maintain and to carry out. Right. And, uh, and so there's just a decision that was made. You know, I've discovered more about the goodness of God since the loss of my dad than I ever knew before. Wow. But it's, it's kind of like you have to position yourself. You know, it's kind of like you're going down a river in a canoe. You know, you position yourself to, to make it through safely. Mm. And a lot of people don't position themselves and they find themselves in catastrophe because they didn't manage their heart well. And you've got to manage your heart well. The wow. attitude of the heart that you, you know, when my dad died, I determined that I was going to take the moment and hold it close to me. Uh, the pain, the confusion, the, the disappointment, all the stuff that you have, that you experience in yeah. loss. Hold it really close and then worship God in that context. Because in that context, I'd be able to give God an offering of praise and worship that I'd never have a chance to give Him in eternity. Because I won't feel disappointment or loss. There'll be no tears, there'll be no pain there. So I won't have that context. So I w I've got to grab my opportunities now because grabbing those opportunities is what shapes our heart for the long term. The Pool of Bethesda, if that were to happen today, all the reporters would be interviewing all the other people that were around the pool that didn't right. get healed. Right. Because so much of our theology is, is based on what didn't happen. Uh, the Bible celebrates the miracle that happened yeah. because when we celebrate it, it creates a momentum where the rest around the pool get healed. You know, it's, it's like we get to carry on the responsibility beyond the one. And, uh, and yeah, then we've so just... The Bible celebrated the man that got healed. Exactly. Not the masses that did not. Nope. And that's, that's part of the ongoing breakthrough is you learn the culture of heaven, which is the focus on what God has done, what he is doing. Because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When you feed your heart on what he's done, what he's doing, it creates a prophetic anointing on the people of God to carry on in what Jesus did. So it makes it present tense. So it's just a huge part of, of our life is that we... You know, we've had some devastating losses. We've had some tragic experiences, things we can't explain. I don't ever try to explain them. I just try to benefit from them. I try to position my heart so that 
so that I, I don't accuse him. Right. Uh, so I don't do shame and guilt because that doesn't help either. Right. It doesn't help say, well, I just didn't fast enough. I just didn't pray enough. There, there's no progress made in that moment. Uh, right. Jesus is sufficient. So I have to, I have to resist the guilt, shame, that temptation, and resist the thing of accusing God somehow or lowering the standard of Scripture to my level of experience. I can't. I have to fight to raise my level of experience to the standard of Scripture. So if you can make it through those two temptations and then just really set your heart on what God's doing, then you will become more and more equipped to carry it out, yeah. you know, to do it more. When I, I was on the road helping at the Crusades, and I was pastoring at the same time in Orange County. Wow. And I would come back and not see anything happen. Yeah. yeah. And it tortured me. Yeah. You know, I would see the masses come to Jesus. I would be working the healing lines and, you know, tumors falling off of people. And <laughs> I'd get to our church and... Yeah. You know, the, the Reinhard Bunke's words of, I felt like my ministry was a miracle-free zone, I really relate to, because nothing was happening. Yeah. Yeah, but there were a few sporadic touches. Right, right. But I began to focus on what God wasn't doing. Yep. And it really affected me. But Pastor, so when the miracles started really breaking out in your ministry, had your father passed already, or, or were miracles already taking place uh, before his passing? They had already started. They already started. Yeah, wow. They had already started. Yeah, we had, uh, you know, technically they started pretty significantly in 1987. Mm. It was somewhat sporadic, but at least there was a there was some sort of a momentum I had not seen previous to that. Yeah. As following, uh, I attended a John Wimber conference. Wow. He didn't lay hands on any of us. It was just we we came home with something on us that we didn't have when we when we left home, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, we got a real upgrade in '95. Uh, when I went to Toronto, there was, there was just a spontaneously miracles would happen when I got home that, that didn't previous to that. Yeah. And then when Randy Clark came in 97, uh, there was a, a real intentional deposit yeah. that turned miracles from being weekly to daily. And uh, so now it's, it's just an ongoing part of culture. Yeah. We have a responsibility to steward well because, you know, I mean, we're getting more and more breakthrough, but, you know, People come from all over the world. You, you yeah. know what that's like. They come from all over the world. They need a miracle. So many of them, I mean, I'm thankful many of them leave with a miracle. You know, yeah. I mean, we'll have, we'll have anywhere, you know, we just have a lot of nations and states and cities yeah. represented on any given weekend. So we have tons of people that will be there needing a miracle. And in our healing rooms on Saturday morning, a small day will be 200 people, all wow. the way up to over 500 people that will come just for needing a miracle. So when, uh, when they come, if they get a miracle, obviously we celebrate with them. Right. But so many of them, you know, to be honest, they leave the same way they came. And how do you, how and do you deal with that? I'm, I get alone with the Lord. I said, God, they came expecting to meet you when they met me. And all they met was me. Oh, man. And neither of us That's are impressed. Amazing. You've got to do something in me to make this more effective. So you take, in a sense, some responsibility. I do. I do. I realize I'm not the healer. Right. But when Jesus commanded us to heal the sick, I believe he was commanding us to take responsibility. Yeah. You take responsibility. The, his provision is sufficient. His yeah. will has been revealed. Um, he has done everything necessary. Now it's our responsibility to find out how to, how to bring the breakthrough. Yeah, because as a preacher, it's easy to sometimes blame the people who well, aren't yeah. being healed. Yep, you can blame the people. And, and many blame the Lord. So it was just, you know, it's just a sovereign act of God, and He heals when He wants to. It's just not the way Jesus did it, you know. Yeah. It's we've we've got to adjust. It, Jesus Christ is perfect theology. Yes, that's right. Is is we adjust our life to His and and just learn how to do it. And I, I'm learning, but I'm so far from, from arriving. Yeah. But I have no options to quit. I can't change what the Bible says so that I feel better about myself. I'm right. I'm not in this to feel good about myself. Right. I'm in this to be pleasing to the Father. And, uh, and it's not, you know, how many healings I have, you know, notches on the back of my Bible. That has nothing to do with it. It has to do with faithfulness to what he's given. Yeah. And part of that is the responsibility. He said, heal the sick, raise yeah. the dead, cast out devils. I may not do it well, yeah. but I can't change the assignment. I was given the assignment. And so without yeah. doing guilt and shame, without blaming God, I've got to get into the heart of God and find out where, to, where and how to bring a greater breakthrough. Right. That's happening, but it is a process. Yeah, I was on the way, uh, I was in Houston the other day, and mm -hmm. I was on the way to the TV studio to minister with some friends, and 
you know, I jumped on one of those uh, blue shuttles at the airport. Mm -hmm. And as my first time on one, I didn't know they made multiple stops. You know, I thought they'd just zip me straight to where I needed to go. And so we made like 10 stops, and one of the stops was MD Anderson, the cancer center. Wow. And, Pastor, it was slam packed. It looked like a shopping mall. And yeah. I remember pulling up to this place saying, what, who, what are all these people here for? And I noticed a few walking in with beanies and, you know, yeah. skull yeah. caps. And then I saw some didn't have hair. And I looked at the, uh, the sign, it said MD Anderson. And I thought, this is the MD Anderson you hear about all the time. People come to you for, with cancer. Right. And I'm not exaggerating, Pastor. They were walking in and out of that place like a shopping mall during Christmas. Yeah. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, is healing not relevant? Yeah, that's right. What could be more relevant? That's exactly I mean, these right. people are suffering. Their families are walking in and out without them. It touched my heart. It changed me forever. And I yep. went to go tape, and I was lost in the Lord. I remember thinking, to these people, what could be more relevant than getting this tumor that's out of right. their body? That's I right. was down in Phoenix uh, with the sisters of Mary, the Mother Vasilia Schlink. Mm -hmm. And we're good friends with, with their sisters. And I was walking through the prayer garden. And one of the stations was Jesus. They have a sculpture of Jesus tied to the pole, being yeah. flogged. Right. And it was at that moment I realized, this is not about me. Yep. And as much as, it's, as we want the people healed at it, to its highest degree, it's really not even about the people being healed. It's about his stripes not going in vain. That's right. You know, it was your, I have to say this publicly, it was really your teachings <clears throat> that caused me to believe mm. that it wasn't dependent on atmosphere, mm -hmm. though that helps. It's mm -hmm. a wonderful blessing. But that God wants to heal the sick wherever we go. Mm -hmm. And it changed us. And it caused me to celebrate the small things God was doing. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, I, how does honor, because that was the first sermon I ever heard you teach, and I, I, I really believe the Holy Spirit has birthed that culture in Bethel. Because I've never been to a place like Bethel. This is a special, special place. One of the core values is honor, from what I can gather. Yeah, it's true. How, how has honor played a role? Uh, honoring the generals who've gone before us, how has that sense of honor played a role in seeing God work and move among the people? Well, it's huge because it's part of the atmosphere of heaven. Yeah. You know, when we pray on earth as it is in heaven, we're praying for that, that world to invade this one. It's not just miracles, it's way of life, it's value of presence. Everything centers around the presence. It's the value for people. Jesus' big rebuke for Nazareth was, started with that line, there's no uh, prophetess, not without honor except in his hometown. Mm. Why did he bring that word? Because they had just shut down the anointing for miracles in the synagogue where he had read Isaiah 61. So what happened? Nazareth went from a city that was potentially a miracle center to Jesus could do no miracles there except heal a few sick people. Jesus attached the absence of miracles to the absence of honor. Wow. And then he went on and he said, Elijah uh, served the a widow. Um, there was a lot of people affected by the famine in that day. But Elijah was taken outside of his covenant people to minister to this widow to bring supernatural provision. And Jesus' teaching in Luke 4 was Israel didn't get it because they didn't have the honor to draw from what the prophet brought to the game. Wow. And then he went on further and he says, Elisha, Elisha was taken to an enemy, a general of an enemy army to heal leprosy when there's all kinds of leprosy in Israel. Why did it happen? According to Jesus' message, is because of the absence of honor. Honor actually helps us to, we honor a person because they're made in God's image. I, believe it or not, we can honor every person because they're made in the image of God. Mm. We can honor every person because every person has a God-given gift. Right. It's not the devil. The devil doesn't create gifts in people. It's the Lord who gives gifts. And then we honor the anointed person because of the Spirit of God on them. So there's three realms of honor that we're to give. I yeah. celebrate you as a one who's made in the image of God, I celebrate the gifts He's given you, the talents, the abilities, and then the Spirit of God I honor who rests upon you. And because Israel missed that in Jesus, they missed the miracle realm. Or because uh, uh, Israel missed it in Elijah and Elisha, they missed the miracle realm. Because Nazareth missed it with Jesus, they missed it. 
That's the miracle wow. room. So it's then a you huge have part like of life. a centurion or the yeah. Syrophoenician yeah, yeah, yeah. woman yeah. who brings yeah. honor, and yeah. the Lord steps outside of the covenant of Israel. Yep. That's how powerful honor is. It's huge. That's amazing. It's huge. It, it, it's not according to human reasoning. It's not according to, we tend to honor those that we agree with. <laughs> it, it can't be. It can't be that. It can't always be convenient, or it's not. It's not Christian. Right. You know, you have to love those who hate you. That's what. That's what makes it supernatural. Is that I'm, I've tapped into God's love for people because I love people who actually hate me. The whole th issue of honor has to be. It has to work because not everybody deserves it. And even if the people aren't perfect, we're there's gonna, no one who is. Exactly. So, <laughs> in spite of the flaws of some of these servants that I know Bethel has really made a yes. point to honor. Yeah. The Marie Woodworth Edders, the yes. Catherine Kuhlmans, the exactly. Amy Simples, the John G. Lakes. Yeah. Many of their lives, uh, it's easy to focus on what they didn't do or what they failed. Yes, yes. But you've made a decision to honor what God has in them. Can you talk about that? You for have me? to. The Bible honors Solomon, who ended poorly. Right. The Bible honors Hezekiah, who ended poorly. The Bible honors a lot of people. Saul, it highlights what he did correctly. He ended poorly. You have to honor a person for their response to the Spirit of God when they responded. Okay, can you say that again? It's, it, you have to honor a person for their response to the Holy Spirit in the season they responded well. Yeah. Uh, if they ended in failure, see, God didn't remove them from Scripture, hmm. but we remove them from Christian history. Wow. Because we, we like the appearance of being clean. So there's a whole, wow. you, there's a, a political spirit and religious spirit are the two things that really work to dominate the mindsets of the church. The religious spirit picks up stones to throw at the woman caught in adultery. Right. Because the religious spirit has to be known for its choice of righteousness by judgment of people. The political spirit does what, what uh, Pilate did, uh -huh. washes his hands of a matter so I can create a distance so that you never associate me with that problem. So you have the political spirit, the religious spirit. Jesus goes to the woman caught in adultery and is with her. He never gets contaminated by the sin, but kingdom is not willing, is, is not fearful of being associated with the wrong group. And Gosh, the, the, the Lord, this whole thing of appearance of evil has to do with our conduct. It doesn't do with our love for people. Right. And, uh, and so this is just, you, you, we have to. The Lord, I, I feel the Lord spoke to me several years ago. He said, uh, we'd have an opportunity to honor those who either didn't end well or whose news media so soiled, or church media so soiled the reputation that they're, they are despised today. But in the eyes of the Lord, they were a faithful servant to the Lord. We're to honor them. Yes. If we do, the Lord will give us access to their mantles or anointings. Right. Not so we can run around and say, I have so-and-so's mantle, sure. but so that we can function in their breakthrough. Because God honors them. He does. Right. Uh, is there a specific general that stands out the most to you? That, that, oh, that personal is, favorite yeah. is John Lake. Yeah. Yeah, he, his revelation of the kingdom, I, I feel is 100 years ahead of his time. I don't know anyone I've ever read that carried his insight. Yeah. Yeah, just bringing it to earth. He, yeah, he, many function in extraordinary faith, which I, I just love, you know, what yeah. is worth and all these people. I mean, they were, they were all amazing in their own unique way. Yeah. But there's something about Lake and his understanding that really rattles me. He knew what he was doing when, when many were just responding. He, he operated out of a renewed mind, a perspective of the kingdom that is rare. So he's, yeah. he's a personal favorite by far. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was telling some of your team before, uh, hand before we taped, that my wife's uh, grandfather played piano for Smith Wigglesworth wow. in his meetings, and her, his dad was was close with Smith, and then her grandmother was saved in a Jeffries meeting. Wow! And her mom once actually became a soloist for the Jeffrey brothers, and uh, I was talking to her grandfather for Thanksgiving about what that was like to hang yeah, out with yeah. these guys. He told me about a lunch he had with Reese Howe, Lester Sumrall, Smith Wigglesworth, and Evan Roberts. He was a little kid, but he could play the piano. So, you know, obviously they, they had him around. Yes. Everyone needs a good pianist, yeah. right? a good keyboard player. And I asked him, what was the common thread between those men? You know, what was the one common thread? They all moved differently. 
as far as gifts of the Spirit is concerned. Yeah. This is what he told me, a humility and a simple love for Jesus. Yep. Yeah, they, he said they were all so meek. Mm. At that table, he said the last thing you would have thought is that these guys were Smith, Wrigglesworth, Evan Roberts, Reese, Howe, and Lester Sumrall. But there was a meekness on them that, that, that they all carried. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I'm so grateful for the stance you, you've taken. You know, my, my old golf coach used to say, I played collegiate golf, and my old golf coach used to say, we had a kid speak up in a practice once. Our coach won the U.S. Amateur. And he was old by the time he was coaching us, but a kid spoke up and said, uh, Coach, you're washed up. And he said, Son, it's better to be a has-been than a never was. <laughs> he yeah. said, and you're a never was. <laughs> so when you win the national championship, then you can call me washed up. But I'm so grateful for this, that, you know? It's good. I'm so grateful uh, for, for, uh, for that truth that I believe has huge. absolutely been imparted yeah. by the Holy Spirit. Pastor Bill, there's people watching right now that are sick yeah. who are believing God to heal them. Uh, would, you, would you pray yeah, and absolutely. I'll agree with you? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's important that we hate what God hates, and He hates disease. He hates affliction. It is not a gift from God. It serves no divine purpose, although God can use it. And we talked about cancer, so I want right now, I want to stand against the spirit of cancer yes, in the name of Jesus. Yes, and I rebuke the tumors that grow in people's bodies. I rebuke that spirit of infirmity that has stolen life. I rebuke you in the name yes. of Jesus. And I speak a healing word in that spine where there's tumors all up and down that spine, that every tumor dissolve now in Jesus' name. I command that stomach cancer and the mouth cancer yes all those uh, manifestations to be gone now in the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit, I pray, even now you'd be released in power over people. You'd, yes. you'd descend upon people almost like an incubator. Put them in the atmosphere of presence yes. where your loving embrace so destroys every root of infirmity that life is poured into people's bodies. God, I'm praying for vindication that everywhere there's been loss, there would be gain. Everywhere there's been loss in family life, in finances, in time, energy, yes. focus, all those things, that there would be gain. You would release a real impartation to every person who has suffered in this and other diseases as well. We just pray a healing yes. word be released in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so yeah, much yeah, for, absolutely. Uh, for being Amen. with us, Pastor. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and just to stay posted. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Thank you. By partnering with Jesus Image, you will help us take the life-saving gospel around the world through international miracle services, conferences, television, and radio. Your giving will change lives for eternity. As a partner, you will receive a free copy of the Jesus book written by Michael. While reading, you will find the Lord in a rare and beautiful way. You will also receive monthly teachings that God has placed on Michael's heart. Visit us online at www.jesusimage.tv or write us at Jesus Image, P.O. Box 953683, Lake Mary, Florida, 32795.